Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy, and thank you for joining us today for our discussion of wind issues, particularly bringing offshore wind to market. We have an outstanding group uh, of speakers who are um, going to be joining us today, and we're going to get to them in just a second. First of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I also want to thank our partners for supporting OEP and this series um, and their commitment to our mission of bringing together diverse voices, different perspectives on energy policy issues in a collaborative and serious civil discussion about energy policy in order to push forward the development of sound energy policy. Thank you to all of our partners and particularly our thanks today to our co-host Shepard Mullen and I'll be introducing in just a moment um, Ben Huffman who is a partner at Shepard Mullen will be moderating our discussion. Um, before we get to that I also want to remind everyone that we are very interested in your questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the second part of the hour. Use the bar on your right side to type in your question and we will get to as many as we possibly can. Um, also on the bar on the right side you'll see some information from our energy library, one of OEP's um, most uh, prominent programs where you can find all kinds of reports, studies, articles on any energy policy topic including the one today which is wind power. Um, now we have a very special guest to kick off the discussion, one of the leaders in Congress on energy policy, um, a representative from California's 9th District since 2007. Congressman Jerry McNerney is with us today. Uh, you may know, of course, that he's a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, that he is a member of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. You may not know that he is one of um, the uh, leading experts on the issue of wind power that we're discussing today. He has a PhD in mathematics. He was an engineering contractor to Sandia National Labs. He was a senior engineer at US Wind Power and before being elected to Congress, he formed a startup to uh, manufacture wind turbines. So we are really honored and privileged to have him with us today to kick off this discussion. Without any further ado, Congressman McNerney. Well, thank you and good morning from the West Coast. Uh, what I want to do is tell, uh, tell you a little bit about um, how I got into wind energy in the first place, uh, what some of the things we did, uh, the transition from uh, wind energy to Congress, uh, which was a big transition, and then a little bit about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was a math grad student uh, back in the 70s, uh, 1970s, uh, interested in wind energy, uh, interested in renewable energy. I wanted to get my hands uh, a little bit more dirty than just math. And I saw a video on the local PBS station uh, that was created by Sandia National Labs on the vertical axis wind turbine dynamics. And uh, I was hooked just immediately. I got the engineering department at the university to get me a job uh, as a program, as a contract programmer to Sandia Labs on their vertical axis wind turbine program. Uh, later in the 1980s, uh, I joined US Wind Power. Uh, they were based in Burlington, Massachusetts, had a wind farm out here in California, but it was a brand new field. Uh, we created design loads from custom dynamics codes that we pr prepared ourselves. Uh, we purchased parts, we assembled a 30 kilowatt wind turbine, which was a big deal, planted it in the hills of New Hampshire, invited our investors in, uh, turned on the power, uh, and the thing started coming apart. Blaze were fine. Everyone was running for cover. So that was our introduction to wind energy. Uh, we went back to the drawing board. I uh, looked at the blade roots. How are we going to make those blade roots last? How are we going to make the foundations hold up? Uh, we put another windmill, more failures. Uh, we improved our drivetrain design. Uh, but before long, we had 3,100 kilowatt wind turbines in the field. And that gave us a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity to learn about wind energy we had lots of failures. Uh, we have lots of learning uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, we created uh, more uh, detailed about our dynamics codes. What are the what are the loads are going to look like? What about the SN curve, uh, steel properties, uh, and, and, and low speed uh, aerodynamics? This was all a brand new field. Uh, and back in 19 in the early 1990s, a U.S. wind power launched a 330 cut kilowatt wind turbine. That was the biggest thing anyone had ever heard of. And we created uh, what we called a two-thirds rule, 
which is that uh, the loads of uh, wind turbines go as the cube of the diameter, whereas the power goes and the energy goes as the square of the diameter. So we figured that there was some point at which the loads would overwhelm energy production uh, and it wouldn't be economic to get any bigger than that. We thought that was about six or 700 kilowatts. So it kind of shows what we knew uh, at that point. Um, but the engineering uh, department, uh, against my wishes, took some design shortcuts in that 330 kilowatt wind turbine. Uh, failures came about um, and warranty exposure failed, uh, brought the company down. Uh, after that, I did a little uh, consulting with a super light, very flexible wind turbine design. Unfortunately, it failed with power strikes, uh, with tower strikes. So lots of failures along the way. Um, uh, but then back in 2004, my son joined the service after 9-11 and called me to let me know that there was an incumbent congressman in our district was running unopposed. Well, what he said was, hey, dad, I'm serving our country. What are you going to do about it? So, my gosh, <laughs> you got me. Uh, I had to uh, I had to, to learn uh, a completely new field. Uh, I lost the first election in 2004, uh, but then I won in 2006. And I can tell you the transition was monumental. Public speaking was an absolute nightmare. Uh, I fell totally flat on my face several times, got up uh, and, and kept going. Uh, but I can tell you, once you're in Congress, uh, you have to address every issue that comes up, whether it's financial collapse, uh, wh whether it's uh, 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 you know, uh, equity issues, energy issues, uh, uh, ju judicial issues. I mean, you have to address all of these things. And so there's an incredible learning curve. Uh, and and it's, a, it's an exciting experience, that's for sure. But the best way to get things done in Congress uh, is to utilize the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, that's where the real work happens. It's important to hire and to utilize an outstanding staff and keep your ears uh, to the ground for opportunities. But you have to be uh, you have to be patient. You have to be relentless in what you care about to make sure that those issues eventually become a part of our uh, of our conversation. Uh, now I'm going to conclude by talking about some of uh, things that are happening in Washington today. Uh, the tax credits, for example, uh, these were necessary for the industry to get started in the early days, and now uh, they're necessary to meet carbon reduction goals. So they're going to keep going, but Unfortunately, these are always extended on a yearly basis. But as you all must know, permitting, financing, project design, long lead items, these make multi-year planning necessary. Uh, and extending the tax credits for longer periods would be much more effective in creating a stable environment for investors and planners and designers. Uh, so that's something that I, I think is a high priority to me. Uh, offshore wind, uh, as you know, as an incredible energy potential both on the west coast and the east coast uh, and the gulf coast the three coasts uh, and a new offshore investment tax credit was signed into law as part of the year end omnibus uh, and that makes offshore wind projects uh, that begin construction before 2026 20, uh, eligible for a 30 percent tax credit so it's significant uh, and i want to make sure that that keeps going uh, currently, there's 12 small <laughs> offshore wind projects, uh, wind farms under review. Uh, the Pacific uh, offshore, as, as you must know, uh, is going to need new technology. I mean, these are floating uh, barges. Uh, how are we going to do this economically? Uh, and and that's, that's a challenge. I mean, offshore uh, oil rigs can do it, so we can do it, but it's going to take a lot of real good uh, value engineering to make it uh, cost effective. Uh, and recently, the Navy dropped opposition to two projects off the California coast. So we're on the way, actually. Um, and uh, prior, pro and, uh, you again, these are all things you know. Prior planning and uh, prior local work is needed to prevent local opposition. Uh, I've seen this uh, in wind energy. I've seen it in, in nuclear waste disposal. You got to work with the communities uh, to make sure that they're on board with this before you uh, start throwing uh, plans at them. Um, Lastly, uh, President Biden, uh, his uh, Americans Jobs Plan included a $15 billion demonstration of Pacific offshore wind. And the House Appropriations Committee uh, just yesterday was discussing uh, the offshore 
a wind potential and we recognize the need for this to, to move forward so there's a lot of opportunity huge engineering challenges very still a very exciting time to be in the field so with that i'll, I'll yield back thank you thank you so much congressman and uh, those points particularly about um communicating within the community making sure that uh, uh that channel is open i'm sure we're going to hear more discussion about that for the participants but you know really uh having um, a conversation about these things is so important to make sure you get a buy-in from everyone. So really appreciate that and all of your other comments. So thank you so much for sharing those thoughts and taking your time to be with us today. I'm now going to introduce our panel and Ben Huffman, our moderator. I want to thank again Shepard Mullen for being our co-host. Ben is a partner in the firm's energy infrastructure and project finance practice in Chicago. He advises clients all over the country on all aspects of um, project financing around energy infrastructure. We are delighted to have him and the firm involved with us today. And Ben, uh, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our very distinguished panel. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Uh, panelists, pop on up as you get a chance. Um, I am pleased to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Uh, they all have distinguished and interesting personal and professional stories, but in the interest of maximizing our discussion time, I'm forced to be very brief in my introductions. Uh, first up is Joao Matelo. Joao has over 21 years of experience in the power and, re and renewable space, including most recently over seven years as CEO of Principal Power, where he led the implementation of its vision of serving the world's population by unlocking the full potential of floating offshore wind. Principal Power is a re recognized leader in making floating wind turbine foundations a commercial reality. Among other roles, previously, Joao was Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of EDP Renewables North America. Next is Sam Beekner. Sam is a director in the Renewable Energy and, fin and uh, Environmental Finance team at Wells Fargo. Wells is one of the largest providers of financing to renewable energy projects and to the companies that own and uh, operate those projects in the United States. They have invested more than $11 billion in the US renewable energy sector, representing more than 500 projects. In particular, they are perennially one of the top two or three providers of tax equity financing, which is a topic we will touch on uh, in a few minutes. And finally is Will Roberts. Will is the president of Foss Maritime. He has held multiple previous roles with the company, including commercial, uh, Chief Commercial Officer and Chief Operating Officer. He also held executive positions at Rolls-Royce. FOSS operates one of the country's largest fleets of tugboats, as well as duck barges and offshore services vessels. They provide services to, a, uh, to many facets of the energy industry, including uh, most recently having partnered with Demi Offshore for construction of the 800 megawatt Vineyard Wind One uh, offshore wind project. Um, I will very briefly introduce our topic for discussion. We may not be as uh, early on and groundbreaking as the congressman was in the wind industry in the United States at this point, um, but we are still uh, in many ways emerging for offshore wind in particular. Uh, but momentum has gathered behind a number of proposed projects up and down the Atlantic coast, including the Vineyard Wind Project. Uh, which has received its key federal approval at this stage. And the Biden administration has announced its intention that uh, BOEM, the uh, Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, complete review of at least 16 construction and operations plans by 2025, representing more than 19 gigawatts of offshore wind. Uh, the momentum is not limited to the East Coast. We, even since we started planning this panel, the federal government and the state of California made a joint announcement about plans to open up areas uh, to offshore wind developments and Boehm announced a request for interest for a potential offshore wind development in the Gulf of Mexico. We're going to cover a number of topics that are really focused on bringing offshore wind to market at this point. Uh, the permitting issues and, and regulatory issues still remain major hurdles, uh, but today we're going to focus on uh, logistics and supply chain, uh, workforce and finance. And so here's the first question for the panelists. Uh, and, and Joelle, I'm going to start with you on this one, and, and then we'll work around. Um, states and private companies have announced a number of planned port upgrades in the Northeast in anticipation of offshore wind. Given the planned investments that we know about today and the demand that we know about today, 
Will sufficient port infrastructure be available for construction and operation of large scale offshore wind plants? Thank you, Ben, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly think uh, we will. Uh, it, as, as we see now, the, uh, the big volume commitments that are happening along the coast, along the East Coast, and the big announcements from the administration are really spurring uh, real commitments to invest. I think we already have about over $300 million of port upgrades that we see uh, along the East Coast from New Jersey to Connecticut to Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, and I think we should expect more to come as projects move along the permitting line and developers can commit uh, to project to port upgrades. So I think the administration uh, uh, expects up to $500 million of port upgrades um, over the next decade uh, to be announced to, to, to get to the 30 gigawatt mark. I think it's also interesting to see in the West Coast that although um, it's, it's kind of a, a, a green field and there's little done or little committed, there's already uh, a lot of work being done in preparation for the lease upcoming leases. Namely, in the Central Coast, there's already studies being done about the possibility even to have a, a brand new port being developed in San Luis Obispo County. So that's very, very interesting, although not a commitment yet. Uh, a very, very interesting prospect, which I think could invest, could bring investment of over $400 million uh, to that area. So, um, and also in the North Coast, we'll see the Port of Humboldt also making those RFIs to to get those commitments moving over the coming coming months. So, I think um, I think it's it's very interesting. I certainly think that in both coasts, we'll see those investments occurring in time for the projects to happen. And will you operates and FOST operates in in these ports on a regular basis? So has direct experience with this. Um, what what's your view on on the current state of port infrastructure? What um, what do you see both both what we have planned and what do you see as most critical for us to be uh, focused on in preparing our ports for the offshore wind and the vessels that will be servicing it? Thank you, Ben. Um, I agree with Zhao. I think the, the, the opportunities are there and the investments being made. Uh, but if you look in particular, even in New Bedford, uh, the size and scope of the equipment is going to surpass the, the, the size of the hurricane barrier. So there will be a lot of infrastructure that will need to be committed to by these regions. Um, it's possible. It's definitely more uh, feasible on the West Coast where there's a new opportunities and it's a little bit more open. But again, even on the West Coast, there's going to be less ports. So on the East Coast, you have more ports, but they've already been grown over for 300 years. On the West Coast, you have less ports, but uh, maybe an opportunity there. So the opportunity is there, the potential is there, uh, but the equipment is getting larger by the year. And, and these cities on the East Coast, you know, they're, they're, they're small, uh, older cities, small roads, and, and it'll be a definitely a commitment to ensure that the infrastructure works. Uh, if you look over in Europe, they spend a ton of um, money and resources ensuring that the ports are set up for wind. The, the, the roads are set up that way, the, the port infrastructure is there. Uh, so it really must be a commitment to go in that direction. And is it a, a matter of um, sort of making the ports the, the wider, uh, uh, deeper, or is it also, it's a, you're, you're talking about roads. Uh, I didn't even think about roads as a possibility as some you know, port upgrades. I thought about you know, births or things like that. Is it, I mean, it sounds like it's holistic. It's the whole thing. And I think it's an exciting time with the infrastructure bills that are going into place. But we need to understand that our ports are, are not set up for the size and scale of what the wind market will bring. Uh, and we can say that we're bringing everything in by water, but the roads piece is a very interesting piece. I mean, just look at a map of New Bedford and tell me which large piece of equipment you're going to bring in through through the roadways there. Um, and again, if you go over to Europe and you go to Belgium, you go to the Netherlands, you'll see whole towns that have been reconstructed in order to move that equipment through the city. Uh, and, and you know, they'll shut down whole parts of the city in order to get that equipment through. That's the commitment that the, the Europeans have made to their offshore wind. Uh, and that is something we need to focus on in the United States. Um, Joel, back to you briefly on this, on the, on the next item, which is, as we think about this this upgrade, the amount of investment and, and the type of investment that we're making here, are there opportunities um, to approach that investment in a way that decarbonizes uh, the um, associated industries with with offshore wind? I, I certainly think there are, and uh, I guess this is a little bit of a, a challenge to Will, but uh, uh, because he's in the middle of it. But I think uh, there's real, real opportunities when we when you're talking about these levels of commitment. So 
of you know uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, I think there's a real opportunity to invest in the right way, um, all the way from port activities where you know there's obviously already a lot of efforts ongoing to decarbonize ports to get zero emission trucks to feed ports and, and, and things like that. I think those should be part potentially interesting commitments to be to be taken at least partially by, by some of these investments. Um, you know, when you go to offshore and maritime activities, I think uh, um, you know all the the, the, the feeder vessels uh, can potentially move, uh, and we can take steps and use these investments to take steps into decarbonizing that fleet as well. And then you know, even in the long term, I think we'll as we uh, start seeing large vessels for installation being built, uh, you know, in in the next 10, 15 years, can we start making steps to decarbonize those either through ammonia or hydrogen? So I think there's really, really interesting things that can be done when you're committing to such large amount of investment uh, to take steps as part of that to decarbonize uh, the different parts of the value chain. So I think there's a real opportunity here to do that. And, and well, I know uh, in some of the RFPs for the vessels that are out there, there's already some proposals or some requests that the bidders propose um, to uh, submit plans for low carbon or no carbon uh, vessels. Yes, uh, and I think the, the word is it needs to be deliberate. So you can ask for these uh, low carbon, uh, neutrally you know, vessels. If you don't put it as a criteria for selection, then it's not going to happen. Um, almost, in almost every case, uh, this technology is newer, it's more expensive, it is better for the environment. Um, but if you choose to select your partner and your equipment uh, based on lowest price and not have that weighting factor in there, uh, with regards to to these technologies, that it won't happen. Uh, so it's there, uh, and I would also say that the technology is leapfrogging right now when we're talking about hydrogen and we're talking about fuel cells and batteries. Uh, so it's again, it's that deliberateness of getting into going that direction and that commitment. Um, if you're going to talk to an operator like Foss and you're going to ask us to to do something that's 30 or 40 percent more expensive than capital, then I hope you're going to be with us for the next 20 years in order to see the fruits of that and not have that kind of happen in a couple of years where, where the next new thing is coming out. Um, so I think in terms of that decarbonization, it needs to be deliberate and there needs to be a commitment. Great. So Sam, uh, when you come in as a financing provider and, and you're looking at the types of things that Joao and Will are talking about with the, the upgrades that are coming and, and need to be made, um, and you're looking at projects to potentially finance, how are you thinking about these sort of um, supply chain and, and infrastructure upgrade kind of issues? What, what sticks out to you as, as high priority? Yeah, well, first I just wanna say hi and thanks for having me here. And I'm hailing from Rhode Island, the, the proud home of the Block Island Offshore Wind Project. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just start by kind of saying where tax equity plays in the construction cycle. So we typically make a legally binding commitment around notice to proceed. And then we make our first 20% investment at mechanical completion, and then a final investment after the project is, is operational. So being in that position of not actually putting money out the door until the project is mechanically complete, and it's kind of under discussion what that really means, but it's sort of before the first turbine becomes operational, that does insulate us somewhat from some of these supply chain issues because if you can't get uh, your equipment or your vessels out to build the project, you know, we don't build, we don't invest until it's built. But I think the way that it does impact us is to the extent that we say we make a commitment in 2021 or, uh, and then the uh, we think we're going to fund a deal in 2023 or 2024, but there's supply chain issues and that commitment period just extends out further and further and further. Uh, long commitment periods are challenging for banks because we incur capital charges on the uh, capital that we need to allocate during the commitment period. It's also just challenging from a credit and risk perspective to the longer you're committed without funding, the more sort of things can change in the meantime. And then lastly, those longer, you know, two-year commitment periods um, can just make it really hard for us to plan our kind of entrance into the market because we don't have the luxury of committing to a deal, waiting for it to fund, funding it, seeing how it operates, and then making the next commitment. If we did that, you know, we would do one deal every six years. So we'll probably end up uh, accruing multiple unfunded commitments. But 
to before we make the first investment. But to, to sort of go back to your original question, I think the supply chain is definitely an area of diligence for us, but um, our exposure to that kind of risk is mitigated by the fact that we don't fund until mechanical. Sure. Uh, of course, for construction lenders, a uh, different story, um, much more sensitive uh, since they take su such a big chunk of construction risk. And I think, Joao, you may have suggested that in, in a lot of cases, a, a number of these developers are probably going to end up building quite a bit on balance sheet before they can get construction uh, financing in place because of, of that of that risk. Yeah, um, indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, uh, uh, Samantha will correct me, but I think for the most part, in most of these projects, you'll see balance sheet financing happening through construction uh, and then tax equity happening at the end. Um, you know, I think most of the players that are that we're talking about here in offshore wind are players that can fully finance the, the construction and can fully take. And given the, the supply chain uncertainties that are still going to happen in the first few projects, I think the structure finance is going to be a little bit harder uh, in terms of vessel uh, firming and all that. So certainly I think that will be very likely in many projects. Great. Yeah, I would add most of the sponsors we talked to will will raise construction debt and be able to close the construction debt when the tax equity makes their commitment. So they'll do the earlier stage construction on balance sheet, and then they'll bring in the construction debt when the tax equity is committed because the, the tax equity takes out the construction debt. But yeah, but I agree, they do a lot on balance sheet compared to onshore. Great. Okay, let's move on to another uh, topic which is transmission and interconnection infrastructure. This is a really challenging one for our industry and as a whole, not just for offshore wind, but it's compounded for offshore wind because of the um, lack of the existing infrastructure even to, to onshore um, the, uh, the cabling and such necessary for, uh, for the, and, and to build the interconnection points. Um, and, and we uh, all, I think, expect this to become uh, in relatively short order, a major constraint on the uh, construction of offshore wind plants. Joao, as a sort of starting point, how do we deal with this? Um, you know, what's what are we going to need to do in order to um, to address this constraint? Sure. So I think first there's two sides of this. One is the overall renewables problem uh, in terms of transmission. There's uh, you know, we are already seeing big, big announcements from the administration to push transmission, both small projects and big HVDC uh, projects um, uh, onshore. So this need is widespread across the country, uh, and it certainly affects offshore wind and onshore wind, solar and wind as well. So I think over the coming years, we'll see uh, some of these, uh, you know, these, these big investment happening. Uh, you know, uh, I think there's a, over $3 billion in, uh, announced by the Western Power area uh, and the DOE loan program. It has a five billion line for transmission projects alone. Um, and and uh, the, the very interesting part is the potential for the ITC to be applicable for transmission. That's currently uh, under proposal. We hope that if that, that comes through, I think that's going to be extremely helpful for the renewable industry you know, as a whole. In terms of offshore wind specifically, I think there's going to be uh, kind of a few different stages. Obviously, the first few projects are going to connect directly I think likely and paid the, the relative upgrades to to uh, in the, the points of interconnect. But as we move forward in the medium to long term, I think there's going to have to be a need for uh, integrated transmission planning, uh, both onshore and offshore projects. Uh, we already saw an RFI from New Jersey, um, you know, going out. I think it's due this summer uh, to to propose solutions for to connect both onshore and offshore transmission um, to connect 7.5 gigawatts. So. I think we'll see more of that uh, happening um, also along the West Coast. Uh, this is a pretty important topic. Um, it's, it's an important topic, not only in the, in the Central Coast, where we have good, uh, good connections from, from, uh, from existing nuclear, the Commission nuclear plants in the Diablo Canyon, in Morro Bay, uh, but, but, also, but also as if we want to accelerate to get there faster, I think a potential proposition for integrated transmission planning is is also a very interesting option to consider there. Uh, not to mention in the in the north coast, both California and, and Northwest, where uh, that's going to demand for sure an integrated transmission planning for for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, you're going to need either onshore or offshore big lines uh, connecting the, to the load, and I think that's a real opportunity to harvest. 
uh, those needs. So in, in this all couple of weeks, multiple storage projects popping up. Uh, you have storage projects popping up already in, in the Northeast. Uh, in the Central Coast, you have a storage project of 600 megawatts in Morro Bay. So I think it's going to be a mix of transmission and storage, uh, both onshore and offshore uh, being deployed. And Sam, as a financing provider, even if we're not talking about construction risk, we're thinking about it from a tax equity perspective, which is, has little construction risk, the curtailment risk, right, uh, the shared facilities issues, I mean, how do you think about these things as a financing provider? Yeah, I think it's a really big challenge because curtailment is notoriously very difficult to forecast. You know, we work with all the, the top advisors in the industry and just with how much the transmission grid is changing, it's really hard. So I would say, you know, step one is to is to work with those advisors to try to come up with the best forecast we can for curtailment and kind of build those in the financial models so that we're assuming the amount of curtailment that, that we think is going to happen. Uh, but I think step two is really just structural mitigation in the tax equity structures. There's a, there's a lot of different stuff that I won't, you know, bore you all with the details, but there's a lot we could do in terms of commercial protections um, in the financing structures themselves to mitigate the economic, you know, harm to the investors if curtailment is higher than expected or if, you know, something goes haywire with the shared facilities um, to, to kind of preserve those investments. Great. Yeah, this is a topic that we could spend a lot of time. It's one where some uh, that is in, in a lot of ways um, very national and yet very regionalized and maybe sometimes hyper regionalized. And it's very difficult to, to work through Pro probably an area where some some policy work and um, some concentrated efforts would would make a big difference. Um, but we have to leave it for another topic uh, in the interest of time because we could spend all day on transmission. We really could. And, uh, and I think next we'll talk about uh, personnel and workforce matters. And, you know, Will, I, um, I kind of thought about you in, with this topic uh, in part because you, FOSS runs a large scale um, uh, operation that's focused on, on a variety of different areas, but includes uh, a large portion of focus on uh, the existing energy industry. And, uh, this is a little bit of a different approach to things. There's a lot of overlap, obviously. How do you think about um, sort of uh, workforce, uh, approaches to workforce and, and training and personnel uh, as you think about this, this somewhat new area that uh, that we're all expanding into? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning, it, it, this is an overlapping industry within the offshore energy industry. Um, I've lived and worked in Europe uh, in, the, in their offshore sector and been out to the offshore rigs there in both in the wind and just the oil rigs and, and been to the Gulf. The, the skill set is there, uh, but now we're trying to put that skill set into new areas on the U.S. East Coast, which has predominantly not been an oil and gas area. Uh, and we also want to have very much regionalized workforces. Um, so I'll say the skills are there. Uh, there will be a lot of training to, to go on because as we look at those 20 projects that are going to happen on the East Coast, uh, the local content piece on that, which is extremely important to make sure that we're benefiting the areas where this wind energy is coming into, is going to require a lot more of that training. Uh, but I do believe that between the Gulf Coast um, and our European partners, uh, the, the capabilities will be able to be raised up uh, in these markets. Um, but it, is, it, it will stretch it at the beginning. Uh, Massachusetts is not known as an offshore uh, energy um, place, but we have Mass Maritime and we have Maine Maritime and we have Kings Point and a number of maritime schools uh, within, you know, two, three hundred miles of where these operations are happening. So it's a matter of, you know, pivoting towards uh, that training opportunity with those uh, individuals that are graduating from these maritime colleges. And also uh, there was a depressed market within the Gulf Coast. Uh, so there's opportunities uh, to look at how we get that workforce and that training coming from predominantly the, the U.S. Gulf uh, up onto the East Coast, while also ensuring that we, we keep that local content. Uh, but I'm a little less, I, I've seen a couple markers there, I'm a little less scared of that one, I guess. Or a little, I, I believe that the U.S. Mariners, although you go over to Europe and everybody wants to say, you know, that Europe has it all locked down, I believe the U.S. Mariners can handle these these opportunities, and it, it's not. And we'll be just fine. 
That's great. I love the optimism and the view of it as an opportunity, right? And we talk about challenges, but challenges are also on the other side of the coin opportunities. Um, Joao, any any other any thoughts on that as well? No, I, I concur. It, it's it's we have one of the best uh, marine engineering centers in the world, which is Houston, Texas, and Louisiana, and all the Gulf Coast. And we cannot forget that it, it's one of the main centers in the world, and, and that, that that can be totally retooled and totally adapted. Uh, not even retooled, to be honest. It's it's the same tools and the same knowledge uh, to to this industry. Uh, I think uh, obviously we have to use those capabilities uh, to spur the development and to continue. Uh, investing. To be honest, when I when I um, joined Principal Power in 2000, uh, early 2014, um, it, you know there was uh, pretty good uh, universities bringing uh, gr uh, young graduates all over the country. You know, Michigan, Berkeley, Stanford, you know, you name it, Hawaii. Um, but but the reality is we saw a decline over the years, uh, and we saw uh, some of these courses really uh, declining and not having as much uh, offload of graduates. Uh, I think uh, there's a real opportunity to reinvest in those programs. You know, there's a, an example of Maine who's been doing a great job in investing in their program. I think more cases like that should happen and, 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 and continue to grow. The existing programs are just fan, are fantastic all along the, the country. Um, on the blue collar side, I would say there's also, uh, as Will said, a lot of opportunities for uh, real good jobs to be created and, and continue to grow. Uh, I think we've already seen some interesting investments in that side. I think early this year we've had uh, a, a Maryland, Maryland Arcon Training Center to be launched with GWO certifications uh, that applies to you know offshore and onshore operations, to welding, to uh, and to steel fabrication. And I think uh, more investments like that will be needed. But uh, we have everything we need right here, so uh, I'm not worried as well. Hey Ben, I want to jump back onto this and and. Uh... I think of it as a, it's a professional uh, area. It's it's a clean, uh, professional area to get into. I, I think there's a stigma about um, the offshore oil business, maybe you know more rufty tufty. These these vessels are you know hundreds of millions of dollars. The, these crews are, are professionals, trains with with degrees if if needed, um, in working in clean environments and, and very you know high technology. Uh, so I think there needs to be a shift in that mentality. That we're talking about really quality blue collar and white collar jobs, um, and, and and I think it would surprise people to see uh, what a crew looks like on an SOV vessel uh, in Europe and what it'll look like in in the United States in the next couple of years. It, it's definitely not your grandfather's uh, old PSV. Uh, so I think that's another thing we need to to continue to push is that this is a completely new economy. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think those are, are definitely important messages. Those are, yeah, um, uh, huge investments uh, that people are making and in that can really benefit the communities in which they're made. Um, let's spend a little bit of time on finance and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, Sam, we're we're talking about tax equity finance here. It's in part because it's such a unique thing for the United States. It's not something in the Venn diagram of of offshore wind experience um, across the world. There there is no spot that is that is uh, touched tax equity yet. Um, and uh, and so we've got to work through that in the United States in our own way as we uh, use that that tool to um, uh, uh, to help finance these projects. What are some of the tailwinds that we have? Because we have this as this tax equity market, it's been robust for quite a while uh, for onshore renewables. So we have some tailwinds we can take advantage of for offshore. What are some of those? Yeah, so the biggest tailwind is definitely on the policy side, the recent extension of the offshore wind 30% investment tax credit. So Congress passed an, an act in December 2020 that gives offshore wind developers until the end of 2025 to begin construction of their offshore wind projects, and then another 10 years from when construction begins to complete construction in order to qualify for the 30% investment tax credit or ITC, which we think of as kind of the full ITC because 30% ITC is, is what is used um, for the onshore solar projects. Um, so that is huge and provides a lot of runway 
um, and I think really poises the industry for, for significant growth. And prior to that extension, we and I think other tax equity were looking at this market and saying, uh, you know, maybe we do one deal, maybe before the tax credit sunset. This isn't really, you know, worth all the internal approvals. But with that extension of the tax credit, we expect to play in this industry in a major way. We've gotten the internal policy approvals, you know, we intend to transact. And so that is huge. And then I think in addition to that, we just have a lot of financing infrastructure that we can already leverage. So we have uh, financing structures that we've developed for the solar ITC that we can apply to the offshore wind ITC. And then a lot of the partners that we already know and trust um, that develop onshore wind projects are the same developers that are building offshore wind projects. So we can really leverage those existing financing structures, finance, tax credits, and relationships. Great. Um, well, face plenty of headwinds too, though. What what are some of the headwinds that we that we have to face in this in deploying tax equity into, into offshore wind? Yeah. So one is the commitment the the commitment period, which we already talked about. Um, and then another is the fact that it's an investment tax credit for offshore wind as opposed to a production credit for onshore wind has some some benefits and some drawbacks. So the benefits of having an ITC instead of a PTC is that there's less risk because we're taking a tax credit on the upfront fair market value as opposed to the ongoing production. So there's a little less reliance on production for our returns, and that makes it less risky. Because it's a little bit less risky, that does enable us to write bigger checks. We typically write larger checks on the ITC side than the PTC side, and I think other investors do that as well. I still think check size will be a challenge, though. A lot of these projects need a billion dollars or more of tax equity, and I don't know of any tax equity that can write a billion dollar check for a single project, so developers are going to have to find two, three, four investors for of tax equity to play nice in the sandbox together. Um, for every project they want to do. So that's a, that's a process challenge. But, you know, we do have some experience doing that already for, for onshore wind. And then the drawback to the ITC side, it is more tax intensive. You have to have more tax capacity to do an ITC deal because you take all of the credits in one year versus the production tax credits you take over 10 years. Uh, and then ITC deals are less profitable for banks than PTC deals because you get your money back faster, which is a good thing in some senses from a risk perspective, but is a bad thing from the from the profitability standpoint. So the the and then I would just mention the last thing on ITC that is a, a challenge is that when you do an ITC deal as opposed to a PTC deal, you have to make your first 20% investment at mechanical completion versus if it's a production tax credit, you can just fund the whole thing when it's totally operational. So we're going to make an investment at mechanical, you know, before the first turbine's operational. And it's probably going to be a long time between the first turbine going operational and the last turbine going operational. So we're going to be exposed to a lot more construction risk that than we're used to. And that's just going to put more pressure on the sponsors to to be able to sort of get us comfortable that once we put that 20 percent in, we're going to get to a mechanical. We're actually going to get to substantial, you know, final completion where, where we invest our remaining 80 percent. That's great. Yeah, that that's uh, something that we deal with a bit in solar with the larger solar projects where we we have the earlier mechanical completion plan. We mechanical completion doesn't necessarily mean mechanical completion of the entire plant, but for offshore wind, it's right. like even more att attenuated. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Kevin, so we're we are reaching our uh, time for Q and A. I understand we have lots of Q and A from the audience, and so we need to to try to maximize that time. So, Kevin, go for it. Thanks very much, Ben, and thank you to all our panelists. Reminder to our audience that you can still go ahead and enter a question for our panel here, and we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, first question uh, is from Cecil Sheeb. Should government entities fund transmission to offshore sites in Northern Europe? Would this de-risk and accelerate the process of developing generation resources by private entities? Now you want to jump in on that one? I can I can certainly address that one. Uh, so I think there's a real opportunity. You know, in Europe, when you compare, uh, there's actually studies that show when you compare the early investments done in offshore wind in the UK versus, for instance, the later investments done in the Netherlands, 
where there was an integrated transmission planning and actually the offshore transmission was done by the operator um, that's called a company called Tenet. Um, the, the, the reality is you see big drop-offs of cost for the rate payers. So there's, a, there's, real, there's real opportunities uh, to, uh, to potentially do a more integrated planning of transmission. I think that's not going to apply to every single project, but I think there's clusters and areas where that's going to make a lot of sense to potentially do, you know, beach trans HVDC transmission lines uh, to connect. Uh, it can also add, you know, speed up, uh, uh, accelerate development. Uh, if you if you if you get a chunk of development that is done by, you know, in an integrated way, and and you remove that risk from the developer, I think that's a a major potential source of de-risking. And, and I think the European experience, Northern European experience, shows that 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 is potentially a very good option to consider both in the East Coast and in the West Coast. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, next question here, unless there's any additions from our other panelists. Uh, next question is from Nancy Nigerian. What are the biggest hurdles facing offshore wind projects in 2021? And what policy changes seem plausible in this current congressional session? From a FOSS perspective, from a delivery perspective, it's just getting things on contracts uh, in, in an expeditious manner. Um, I'll let somebody else speak to the to speeding up the policy, um, but it's a chicken and egg. Uh, this whole market requires a tremendous amount of vessels and assets, and, and without pen to paper on specific development projects, it's not happening, and it's just everything gets pushed to the right. Um, so we'll, we'll see with Vineyard Wind uh, taken off, and that'll be the first, and we'll see you know hopefully a couple more following after that. Uh, that'll allow a spur of, of investment, and I think it'll just kind of snowball after that. But right now it's it's getting a couple into the, into the pipeline to, to actually get re real on the costs, real on the timelines for building vessels and building the infrastructure and seeing what it really looks like. And I think on the policy side, at least at the federal level, I think we just we just got what we were hoping for in terms of the extension, you know, the gun construction until 2025. So more credits always better. But I think we really just got what we were hoping for. Um, you know, I think there's opportunity to get more on the state side. And then from a tax equity perspective, in terms of challenges for 2021, I don't know that I would frame this as a challenge, but most projects aren't ready for tax equity commitments yet. Vineyard is the, is the first one. And I think that, you know, that tax equity process is underway. Um, but the next projects just, just aren't really ready to be brought to market. So I would, I would guess most tax equity who want to play in this space start making commitments in 22 for projects that fund in 24 and beyond. Uh, just to come back to you on, on one more piece there, uh, anecdotal. Uh, in California, there are 41 state agencies that need to be talked to in order to get in order to work offshore. That's state. That, we're not talking federal. We're not talking about who talks to who. So if you multiply that by how many other states are on the East Coast trying to get their projects going, uh, there it is. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, I would just add that on the policy side, I agree with, with Samantha. I think on the policy side, we've pretty much uh, stabilized what, what we need. I think the ITC for transmission is probably the biggest game changer that could happen, that could affect positively the industry. And then what we're talking about is more exec, uh, in the executive branch um, and on the permitting side, getting those 16 projects approved by 2024 is probably everybody's going to be rushing to be one of those 16 projects. Uh, and so that's going to be a big permitting uh, rush, uh, as Will said. Um, and, and I would say that there's a lot that can be done already that is already being done without the need for policy changes uh, on the infrastructure side, as, as we've talked earlier on the port side and money being funneled uh, through the DOE loan program for some of these upgrades and investment in infrastructure. So um, I think right now the needs are more on the machine of the government than on the policy itself. Yeah, it, it, we've, we're excited to talk about the implementation aspects, which is really a lot of what we're focused on here. But and, and for at least one project, we're definitely at that stage. But there is still a lot of government approval that is needed and that needs to get through the process. Gov the government is getting through the government process is key for 2021. Thank you for that. Speaking of permitting and regulatory issues, we do have a question here, uh, a few questions actually kind of about the actual permitting process itself. 
curious if I could combine these all into one question for your thoughts on you know the state of permitting and uh, regulatory process around these uh, with respect to not just green energy but wind specifically here. Uh, are there changes you'd like to see or changes that we expect to see in the coming year or two? Yeah, you I guess I'll jump in there again. <laughs> go ahead, go, go ahead. No, 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 Joe, please. I'm I'm a little farther downstream, so I have a little less uh, less skin in this one. So. No, no. I, I was. Well, I guess I've already mentioned. I think. Um, I think this the simplification of the agency and the interagency work is is probably the most important. I think with the announcement we just saw in the West Coast for um, you know the agreement between the Navy and Boeing. Uh, is a pretty big move uh, in, in the right direction. That's the type of thing we need to see happening. Um, and, and, and because I think, I think the big risk for the industry uh, remains political cycles, um, as, as we saw in Vineyard. Uh, and I think, you know, addressing those within the political cycle and getting projects approved is, is pretty critical. I think nobody will be excited to go into uh, 2024 with major permit pending, I think. <laughs> Uh, at this point. So I think interagency uh, impro improvements is probably one of the most important things to do. I think there's some work that the industry needs to do. Uh, I think on the, there's not everything has been done. I think on the, there's a lot of stakeholder outreach that needs to be better done by an industry up front. You know, talking about commercial fishing, this is an issue all around the world. Uh, and it can, this is, these are issues that can go all the way into construction. We just saw a major project in northern France to be stopped because of the fishermen's a protest. So uh, I think the industry needs to do more in these local stakeholders outreach up front and having those agreements in place up front. Uh, this is probably, we shouldn't put it all on the government. I think there's more work to be done by the industry here. And the rules don't need to change per se, but the process of implementing them needs to, to, to speed up and be more coordinated. Well, thank you for that. We do have also have a couple questions here regarding sort of the environmental impact of offshore wind. Uh, you did mention some, uh, you know, earlier we talked a little bit about how the new wind equipment is better for the environment. Uh, would you be able to provide some examples or do you have anything on the, you know, off the top of your head about how this actually is better for the environment than alternatives? I guess I, I, I'll, Ben, yeah, you go ahead. Go for it. No, no, cool. Uh, so uh, I think, well, starting through the end of through the end of the question, the alternatives. I think the alternatives are, you know, uh, not being able to reach our targets of, of net zero emissions. That's the most important element. Um, and offshore wind plays a key role in achieving those targets in the coastal areas of our country and around the globe. To be honest, uh, it's the largest uh, renewable energy growth uh, industry right now in the world. Um, in terms of the environmental impact, you know. There's no question any type of energy development has environmental impact. So that's the reality of any type of energy development. Um, you know, can those mit be mitigated? Yes. I think what offshore wind has proven all around the world, uh, and, and namely in Europe, is that uh, environmental impact it can be limited. Uh, I think there is a construction element to it uh, that is, uh, I think, is, uh, goes through very, very strict author authority and, and very strict permitting. Um, you know, um, affecting ma uh, marine mammals continues to be an important aspect, uh, both in the East Coast and the West Coast. I think that's going to continue to be a very important aspect, uh, both during construction and operation. Uh, but beyond, you know, uh, you know that I think in terms of visibility to, to the to the seashores, uh, that's going to be less and less of an issue because uh, the projects are going to be done more and more out there. Uh, in the West Coast, most projects will be done beyond site. Uh, so that's going to become less and less of an issue. And, and as projects are done further away from the coast, you have less avian issues as well. Uh, you have generally less environmental impact. Even on fishing, you have less environmental impact. So I think, um, you know, probably the marine mammals and, 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 and will continue to be probably an, a very, very important aspect of things. Uh, but generally, as we go further uh, to, to chase the wind resource, I think uh, all the other um, impacts will be uh, you know, relatively limited. Because the wildlife actually, you know, it's it's been proven over and over again that actually wildlife improves the wildlife, you know, regime in in the wind farm space actually improves um, uh, during the operation of the wind farm uh, because it becomes a kind of a protected area. So 
um, uh, I, I think uh, we'll see at the least you can see uh, within energy development uh, when, when it comes to energy development. Thank you very much. Looks like we do have time for one or two more questions here. Uh, a couple of questions on supply chain for uh, offshore projects. You know, question from Herschel Spector is, do we need jack ships to install offshore wind turbines? And if so, where are we going to get them? To add to that, you know, do you foresee any issues with the supply chain uh, for materials needed to build these offshore plants? Or is that a consideration we're thinking about at this point? Well, why don't we start the, the first piece with you? Uh, jacket bridge would be very effective. Uh, there are alternatives to starting projects uh, without using bespoke jack up uh, vessels. Um, but again, I think with the volume of work that's going to come as soon as we have a half a dozen of these projects in the works, then, then that'll solve itself uh, and we'll find the most efficient way uh, of doing these projects. Um, to that point, when you have six projects, maybe the projects will actually talk to each other and we can use some of the same equipment across. Uh, but as long as we're still looking at 20 separate projects, it makes it a little bit more difficult to look at bringing on one of those jack-up vessels specifically for one project vice the ability to work across multiple projects. Uh, so is it a necessity? No. Uh, would it be recommended that that be one of the first things that, that is on the plate to be built for a couple of the projects? Yes. Um, what was the second part to that? Was it the infrastructure around building these vessels or, or, or doing the projects? Could somebody repeat that one? Sure, we've had a few questions on just the supply chain itself, materials needed for the wind turbines on the offshore uh, wind farms. So it's more a question just about the state of the supply chain. I think the state of the supply chain globally is mature. Uh, and when you're looking at the actual wind components uh, between the major equipment suppliers for the, those components, I don't see that as being the, the holding, us, holding us back. Uh, and, and you know, FOSS is teaming up with Deme, that's a, that's a worldwide leader in understanding how to install these vessels, install these installations. Uh, and I, we, we haven't seen that as being a, a top concern. Um, I definitely see, you know, the vessel per chance is, you know, they're, they're slow in being built in the United States. Um, they're, they're very expensive and, and no one's signing up for them yet. Uh, so we'll see if the ongoing, you know, new projects coming along will allow for the speeding up of that. Uh, quite honestly, uh, building a, world-class uh, offshore wind vessel uh, hasn't been done in the United States. Uh, we have the capabilities. I know we will, we will get there, um, but we need to build more of them to get more proficient at it and to lower that supply chain timing down. Thank you for that. Uh, it's like Maybe I'll add to, to, to the point of the vessels that, uh, you know, I think we already see some interesting movements. Um, uh, you know, in the in the East Coast, we already have some important announcements by the Minion to build, uh, you know, a, a over $500 million vessel. Uh, I think we'll we'll see uh, more of those to come. And that's already actually been chartered also by other developers, uh, which is really, if point goes to the point of will, you already start seeing this, you know, tag teaming uh, between developers. Um, in the West Coast, actually, you won't need those type of vessels and will will sleep and, and other fleets will be very well suited to deploy floating offshore wind, which does need the vessel component. Uh, on the other uh, side of the, the things, I think we'll, we are already seeing some important investments in the, in the supply chain. Um, we, we've seen announcements of, uh, uh, I think, close to $700 million of announcements of, you know, to build the steel structures for foundations. Uh, that's probably one of the areas that's going to grow the most, as well as cables. Uh, where we'll see, uh, we're already seeing, I think, close to half a billion dollars of investments being announced. Uh, so uh, those, uh, you know, steel manufacturing and assembly uh, is going to continue to be an area of, I think, need for investment. In the West Coast, a lot has to be figured out. So if, if you don't want to have to bring everything from Asia uh, to build uh, to build floating platforms in, in, in the West Coast. And then in the long term, I think we'll see more and more announcements of turbine manufacturers as they get comfortable with the volume. I think Siemens Gamis is already planning a facility uh, down in the East Coast, and um, uh, there's already, uh, you know, possible announcements. But I think the, the turbine components are probably the ones that will come a little bit later, since those are a little bit more complex supply chain transfers. Uh, but uh, but but there you are already seeing, uh, you know, I think close to 1.5 billion of just manufacturing commitments uh, around the country. You know, I hate to jump in right now because uh this is such a fascinating conversation 
sure we could really go on for a long time, but unfortunately we're at the top of the hour and I want to be respectful of all of you and all of our audience and thank our, um, our community for being part of this and particular thanks to uh, you, Joao, Sam, Will, and Ben for a very insightful discussion on such an important topic. Um, my thanks again to Congressman McNerney for his observations at the beginning, um, to all our partners, and particularly Shepard Mullen for co-hosting this event. Um, I do want to I give everyone um, a, an encouragement to use uh, the our energy library that you can find on the OEP website for the work that you're doing. I know everyone out there in different parts of the energy sector are working on these important issues, and um, I urge you to take advantage of um, that resource if it can be helpful in your work. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again shortly, uh, and please uh, stay well and have a good rest of the week. Thanks once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.